session, Karen Cummings from Southern Connecticut State University is going to talk about to us about a subject which sometimes uh, produces uh, feelings of nervousness and sweating. Uh, but it's a subject if you become a little bit knowledgeable, you'll be way far ahead of your colleagues. And there are ways that this knowledge will endear you to department chairs and deans and other such folks dealing with this topic of evaluation and assessment. Something that none of us have any formal training in whatsoever. Right. But again, just a little bit of knowledge will put you way out ahead. And you really can both serve yourself and your students well, but also help your institution, either the department or at the institutional level, really come to grips with this issue of how do you determine what students are actually learning or not. And if you don't know, you will certainly hear this on your own campus. People are going to be asking and demanding from you evidence for how students learn or not learn. Fortunately, as Karen will explain, in physics and astronomy, there are vast resources out there to help you do that. You don't have to invent anything at all. So uh, Karen, let me say, give you a little bit about her background has been involved in physics education issues for a few years. Yeah. Uh, when she was, just let me mention a couple of things. When she was at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, she was very engaged in developing what became called studio physics, a way of teaching which changes not only what goes on in the classroom, but the physical environment in which that classroom takes place. And that has sort of rippled across the country in many different forms. And you'll, if you, ever are engaged in having a new science building on campus, this has become a common topic. How do we want to organize the physical space to enhance what we want to do with students? We're no longer building these 500 or 1,000 seat lecture halls, but how do we get a physical environment which matches our pedagogical goals and so on? She uh, moved to Southern Connecticut State University where she's been very active in uh, physics education research, among ma many other kinds of activities. Uh, she recently wrote a sort of history of physics education research that fed into a National Research Council report on what's called discipline-based education research, which was mentioned briefly the other day. So she's been active at both the local and national levels in many ways. So I'll turn things over to Karen. Thank you. So um, as you know, we're taping um, these talks. and. So we've got all these different sort of issues associated with that, but the one that we didn't um, grapple with, which will be a big one, is that I don't stand still. So um, I'll, I'll do my best to stand in one place. Um, you're, uh, it's okay? Yep. Okay, good. Because <laughs> um, it, it some, it's, it's something I'm not especially good at is standing still. So, um, so let me just start by saying that there are reasons to do assessment that, um, sort of involve um, making clear to other people uh, what's going on in your classroom, in your department, at your university. That I only mentioned briefly on like the second to last slide in this talk. What I want to talk to you about is sort of my personal view of why assessment is one of the most meaningful, interesting and most meaningful things <coughs> that you can do as an educator. So this is not a talk about you know, how to get the information together for your accreditation, although you can use all of this for that pur those purposes as well. But I just want to make it clear that what I'm going to talk to you about here is a much more personal story than that. So um, be prepared. Um, I want to give you an overview of the talk. We're gonna, I'm going to start with giving you some context about who I am, what my background is, and sort of where I come from in regard to assessment. Um, I want to give you sort of my definition of assessment, um, why I think you should engage in it, um, what kinds of things you can assess in your classrooms. Um, I want to give you some examples of assessment instruments that exist. Um, and I apologize that I was not together enough to get on your um, USB stick uh, a copy of all of these assessments, but I'll make a little folder that we can maybe leave on one of the computers out in the hallway, and you can pick that up and put it onto your USB port if you are interested in these assessments, so you can have all of these tools that I'm going to discuss today. Um, 
I also want to give you some examples of findings, because I just think it's a more interesting talk that way. And there are some important messages that I think new faculty members should hear. People, once you've been in the field for quite a while, especially if you go to AAPT, American Association of Physics Teachers meetings, there are, there are lessons that have been learned and data that's been in existence for so long that people sort of take it for granted that everybody knows about it. But as new faculty members, I assume that many of you have not heard some of these things, and I want to make sure that you have. Um, and then I want to close with trying to give you some pointers about how you can engage in assessment in a way that's meaningful for, meaningful for you, but that is not a huge additional burden on top of everything else that you need to do. So let me just start quickly with my background. Um, I was trained as an experimental condensed matter physicist. Um, my husband is also a physicist, so we had that classic two-body problem where you have to find two jobs in a remotely commutable distance away. So my commute is about two hours and his is a half an hour, and I'm not exactly sure how that worked out, but <laughs> all right. So in the meantime, while I was finding a job that I loved and he was keeping the job that he loved, I worked at a, a, a whole range of different kinds of places. From a community college, I worked at a small liberal arts college, Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. I'm kind of an upstate New York girl. I work in Connecticut now, but as I said, I drive there. Um, I worked at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI. It's sort of a top 25 university, really an engineering school. Um, and I now work at a state university in an urban environment where my students work too much. The, they, 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 they say they work 30 hours a week on average. They come in with a huge range, range of preparation background um, and motivation to learn and everything else. So it's really a very different population than I worked with at RPI. It could hardly be more different. So I really have a range of experiences in uh, different settings. And so I can relate to many of the things that, um, that you folks are going through. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I am not a developer of educational materials or techniques. So most of the people who are talking to you um, at this um, event are people who have developed materials or pedagogical techniques or both. And they're sort of presenting to you what they have developed and what evidence they have that it works and insights into how to make it work and things like that. I'm not one of those people. I don't develop these techniques. But I was you more than 15 years ago, but less than 20, I'm sure. Hi, Ron. Um, I came to a workshop, you know, not knowing any of this stuff, and I saw the same kinds of presentations, some, some of them with the same people, and I, I learned that there were techniques that looked really promising, and I started using some of those techniques in my classroom. And because I am a data-oriented person, because I need evidence, um, again, trained as a condensed matter physicist, I'm a skeptical person. I needed evidence, I needed data, and so I very naturally turned to assessment to try to make sense of what I was doing, why I was doing, and if it, if it really did make a difference for my students, and, and if so, how. So I've used the techniques that you're learning about. I've used the materials that you're learning about. I still use most of them. It changes from class to class. And I use um, assessment on a regular basis, and I'm going to try to make it clear to you why I do. I'm a tenured full professor. Nobody can make me do anything I don't want to do, and yet still, every semester, I assess in my classes. Okay, and I'm going to try to tell you a story that makes it clear to you why you might want to do that. So a little more history. This is sort of how I really got interested in assessment. I was working at a community college. I was like on a break or something, and I saw this magazine about reinventing undergraduate education. And you know, there's like this call-out box in the article, and it said, we're shifting the emphasis on teaching to an emphasis on learning. Now, some people are giggling, and that might be because you have no idea what that really means. And I had no idea what that meant at the time. I really, I read it, and I had no idea what it meant. And I, probably like you, am the kind of person who needs to make sense of, of things, right? So, so I'm thinking, here's a nice glossy magazine. This is in a call-out box. There must be meaning to this statement that has no meaning in my mind. And it really bothered me for a long time. And then a, a few years later, maybe three or four years later, um, I went to a workshop a lot like this, and Bob Hilborn gave a talk like I'm giving now, where he talked about how we could assess student conceptual learning. Um, and, and then I understood the quote. 
And what the quote says is that we are not going to focus on what you do in the classroom. What we're going to focus on is what do your students actually learn. So for example, let me give you a clear example of this difference. When you're sitting in your department meeting and you're trying to figure out how you can cram a textbook worth of material that used to be taught over the course of two years, four semesters, into what is now largely a one year, two semester course, and you're trying to figure out how can we cram all that material into that course, you are talking about teaching. And you are not talking about, you are not focusing on learning. What do the students actually learn as a result of making particular choices? Right? So that's what assessment does. It shifts the focus onto what is actually being learned as opposed to what you're doing in the classroom. And like lots of things, that's sort of a subtle difference. And those are connected ideas. right? Because hopefully, how you teach does impact how much your students learn, but not necessarily. And the, the statement, which I think is really the important one, is Let's really keep the focus not on what we're doing, but on what is being learned. And if you do that, then you can make really good choices about how you spend your time in the classroom. So that's sort of this, the whole talk, and I can go home now. Um, but again, I'll continue. So at the bottom here, this is just a picture I picked up from the internet. I don't know if you guys can make this out, but this is a flipped classroom. I don't know if you've heard about flipped classrooms, but flipped classrooms is this idea that the students do sort of their reading and stuff outside of class, and then they come to class and they do their homework and they work on stuff in the class. So the teacher's not delivering sort of factual knowledge. The teacher is in the classroom working as, a, as sort of a coach, and the, the gathering of factual information takes place outside of the classroom. Now, sounds maybe like a good idea to you. Sounds like maybe a bad idea to you. I don't know, but you know who can answer that question? Assessment can answer that question. And the answer may not be the same for all classrooms, for all environments, for all courses, but that's what assessment does. It shifts the emphasis from how we are teaching to what the students are actually learning in those environments or how much they're learning. So um, that's the story. So let me, let me just start by saying that when I talk about assessment, I am not talking about like your exams or your homeworks, although those, those are called assessments. The, the, I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about um, measures of student learning or student attitude, some characteristic of the student um, that's used not to grade the student, but to evaluate your curriculum or your pedagogy. Um, so the, so a measure of a student characteristic, it's often used to evaluate curriculum or pedagogy. It's always used to improve learning or other outcomes in the course. That's the purpose of assessment as I'm defining it. The role is not to grade the students, and it's also not to grade you. Okay, So if you feel like assessment is grading you as a teacher, I, 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 I want you to I want to ask you to please take a deep breath and get that idea out of your head. You should engage in assessment so that you can get real evidence, real data to inform you about what has happened in your classroom without all the messiness that goes into a lot of the things that are graded. And I'll, I'll come back to that point. So why engage in assessment? Well, I'll tell you why I engage in assessment. I did to start with, and I do today. The reason why is because when I came out with my PhD, I looked at an environment where we had magazines that talked about transforming undergraduate education. It was sort of at a point where we were you know, on the upward slope and even kind of almost reaching a, a crest of a local, you know, this goes on throughout history, up and down, right? But it was at a point where people were saying, STEM education is not where it should be. We need to think in new ways. We need to do new things. And there were resources that were going into that. Now, to some extent, that's still true today. Maybe it's more true today. I don't know. But all I can tell you is that I could be hanging out in a community college in the Berkshires of Massachusetts and pick up a magazine sort of by accident that talked about transforming undergraduate education. And so I wanted to be a part of that. I didn't want to be a teacher who walked in and went through the motions. I wanted to be somebody who was part of a movement to improve science education. 
An assessment is, a, I saw that as the avenue for doing it. Not what somebody else thought was a good idea to do, not my instinct about what was a good idea to do, not what seemed like a cool thing to do, but things that produced evidence of improved learning. And so I'm, as you can tell, a big fan of assessment. Um, I also found as a teacher that it was really important for me to figure out what my students were learning in my class, what they were not learning in, their, in my class, what they knew coming into my class, what they did not know coming into my class. It, it empowered me to make really effective and efficient decisions about how I was going to spend my time, what I was going to spend my time focusing on, where I was going to start the conversation. All right? As is always the case, you know, I can't walk in here and start talking to you about some high level um, assessment information if you don't even know sort of the basics of it. It's the same with our students. You know, if we assume they understand X, Y, and Z, and we start here, and then it turns out they didn't understand this, we, we have a problem from almost the beginning. Right? So this is another thing that assessment does for me. So let me just say that in order, you know, so, so this slide says what should you assess, what to assess in your class. Let me just say that in order for you to care about assessment, in order for you to care about what the outcomes are, you need to know what you want to do in your courses. So yesterday, at the very beginning of the meeting, Bob asked you to write down three, your top three goals for a course you were teaching, your top three goals for that course. I don't know how, how, how hard that was for different people in the room. I assume for some people it was hard and other people easier. But you need to know what you want to accomplish in a course, or you will not accomplish it, almost certainly. If you do, you are lucky, all right? So you need to start with, what do you want to do? What are your course goals? Now, I, I would ask you, what are your course goals, and make you write them down. But we did that yesterday, and I would rather talk than watch you guys write. So, so I'll just assume that your, your, your thinking about course goals has not evolved too much since yesterday afternoon, but I do really want to say this carefully. I, as you go back and you start thinking about your spring courses, when you're putting together a syllabus, you should be able to write down, even if you don't put it on the syllabus, what, you, what are your top three goals for that course? And stay focused on whether or not you are meeting those goals. Um, so some of the things that you might want to accomplish in your courses that we heard about yesterday, um, where people want students to develop some sort of content knowledge, some con conceptual knowledge associated with mechanics or E&M or quantum mechanics or cosmology or whatever, but there's some sort of conceptual information that the instructors often want students to get from a course. Um, another goal that came up a lot was problem solving ability, and I put down textbook problem solving ability um, only because it's hard to assess really true problem solving ability where, you know, there, there are people who can just figure out how to solve any problem from, you know, why the car won't start to how to get the, the uh, electronic tax preparation software to let you submit electronically. You know, just whatever the problem is, they can figure it out. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about problem solving within this sort of limited and somewhat artificial domain of textbook style problems. Um, students' attitudes and expectations about learning science. These things came up. Um, you know, what, what students think it's going to take to learn science, how students sort of view what science is. Um, these are all shifting those, um, those attitudes and those expectations and those views in what we would consider a positive direction is a, is a common course goal. Might not be one of your top three, but it's a common one. General scientific reasoning, reasoning ability. Do they know, uh, you know how to control variables in experimental design? Do they understand proportional reasoning? Um, can they, they think in terms of probabilities? You know, just sort of general scientific reasoning ability laboratory skills, all of these things may be goals that you have for your course. I don't know, but what I do know is there are existing assessments which measure all of these things. So if they end up on your top three, you could assess them without having to do any work to get the assessment. All right, all you have to do is put it on your stick out in the hallway and you would have these. 
If your goals are not on here, or you teach cosmology, which we do not have a conceptual assessment for, I don't believe, but maybe we do, um, then you can write your own. Um, people do that regularly. I've done it. Um, and I think if you come, maybe if you come back for the reunion talk, then, then we could talk a little bit about how you could develop your own assessments. But to start with, let's talk about assessments that exist that you could just start using easily. So the really common ones are conceptual diagnostics. And the reason these are the really common ones is because there's a lot of agreement about what the important concepts are in these courses, more agreement than what it looks like to be a good problem solver, more agreement than what it looks like to have good scientific reasoning ability. The conceptual pieces tend to, there tends to be a lot of agreement about what, what's important and what it looks like when students understand that material. Those, um, the, the conceptual domain also is a little bit easier to test with multiple choice questions, which makes it easy to do the assessments. Although, although most of the assessments I'm going to talk to you about are multiple choice assessments, um, Lillian McDermott said something yesterday that I think is really important to, to hear, which is that students can get right answers for totally wrong reasons. And so just because they got a right answer, a correct answer does not necessarily mean that they understand the material, although usually when they get a wrong answer you, and you talk to them, it's true, they don't understand it. So I usually look at these assessments as being fairly clear indicators of what students, um, sort of a, a minimum bar. They, they, may, they don't have an understanding which is any better than what's indicated on the assessments. So in bold here are assessments that, um, there, there are all kinds of conceptual diagnostics. So quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, waves, energy and momentum, lots of E&M, circuits, a lot of mechanics-oriented stuff. The ones that are in bold are in bold for two reasons. One, they're used a lot, so it's worthwhile sort of having them as part of your ability to communicate with other people, like somebody could talk to you about them. For example, you will get talked to, somebody will mention these exams tonight and tomorrow. I nearly guarantee it. The Force Concept Inventory, FCI, and the Force in Motion Conceptual Evaluation, FMCE. And, and I will give you a quiz if I see you Sunday morning and ask you who talked about them. All right? So pay attention, watch for the assessment data. But um, assessment data, research data that comes from those two assessments is all over, all right? So they're Im important to know about. And then the conceptual survey of magnetism as well. There's a lot, a lot that's done. People use those exams a lot, all right? Um, but there's a wide range available. So how, how do we give these assessments? Well, critical to these assessments are what's called pre-instruction, post-instruction testing. And again, Lily McDermott touched on this yesterday. Um, her her pre-instruction, post-instruction testing model is a little bit unusual in that she she does um, when they when at University of Washington when they do a pre-instruction measurement, it's actually after they've done the instruction in the lecture, but before they've done instruction with their materials, the tutorials or whatever they're going to be using. Most people, when they talk about pre-instruction assessment, they mean before they've had any instruction in your course on that material. And then post-instruction, regardless of whether you're at the University of Washington or anyplace else, is after the students have been instructed with the materials or techniques that you're trying to, to use. All right? So usually what happens is the assessment tool, say the force motion conceptual evaluation, FMCE, is given at the beginning of the course. The exact same assessment is given at the end of the course. The exact same assessment, okay? If I say anything that you have like a clarification question on, like I don't want to debate whether MOOCs are good or bad in the middle of my talk because I'm selfish. Um, but if you like, if I say something that you don't understand, you have a question, just raise your hand and let me know. You don't have to wait till the end. So, um, so assessment, the pre-assessment is given at the beginning of the course. The same assessment is given at the end of the course. No, the students don't remember it. If teaching was that easy, this is what we'd do with everything. We'd give them a test at the beginning of the course and we'd tell them, you know, you see the same test at the end of the course, make sure you figure all this stuff out. And, um, 
does, it actually doesn't work. I don't know if anybody has ever tried that, like given a question on a test and told, and they did terribly, and you tell the students, you're going to see this exact same question on the final. And you put the exact same question on the final, and they still do terribly. Um, I always find that very frustrating. Yes? Yes, so. Sure, so the question was, if they're not graded, which is typically the way these are done, and certainly the way a pretest would need to be done, right? You can't count a pretest towards a student's grade. How do you know that the students are taking them seriously? Well, there's a, a couple of different ways to see how seriously students are taking a test. One is that you watch them when they're taking the test. And you can watch people and sort of tell whether or not they're taking it seriously. So for example, I can look around the room and figure out whether you're taking my talk seriously by how many people are looking at me, how many people are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, how long they take to do it. Things like A, B, C, D, E, F, G as an answer usually means they didn't take it seriously. In addition to that, once you know these exams, there are patterns of answers that students tend to give based on patterns of thinking that they have. And so you can, you can look for that. But at the very end of all of that discussion, even if the students don't do the best that they can, I always come back to something that I already said, which is that these are, these are, sort, of, these are sort of crude measures, right? So, you, you don't know that this student did their very best. But if you give it to a bunch of students and you watch them and it looks like they're doing seriously and after they take it, students are coming up to you, because my students do this, they'll come up and they'll say like, well, what was the answer to this one and stuff? You can be sure that on average they took it pretty seriously. The other thing that you can do is you can scare them, which is what I do. It's my general tactic for just about everything. Um, and so I, I tell them, um, I'm going to watch you. And I can tell by looking at your paper whether or not you've taken this exam seriously. Not based on whether your answers are right or wrong, but based on patterns that people tend to have in the way they answer. So long as you take the exam seriously, you'll get full credit for a homework assignment, today's lab, pick it, right? You just give them full credit if they've taken it seriously, and you tell them you're not getting that credit if I think you didn't take this exam seriously. And that'll take care of, you know, 90% of the trouble. And you, you, you know, you can't ever take care of all of it, all right? It's a long answer, but did I answer your question? You, you can't ever be sure of anything, right? Um, typically, these assessments are given unannounced. So the pretest is given unannounced, and the post-test is given unannounced. One thing that's really important to, to read here is that these assessments are not returned, okay? Because these are research tools. And if you return them at many of your institutions, they will be archived at the fraternity houses, they will be scanned and posted on the web. There's all kinds of things that will happen. So not grading them and not returning them allows them to stay viable instruments for assessment. So again, this is not assessment for student grades. This is assessment trying to harvest some data which informs your own understanding of what has worked, what has not worked in your instruction. So um, what are the advantages of this kind of a model? Well, it does measure learning as opposed to existing knowledge. Since you give a pretest, you know where students came in, and you can look at a difference between where a student came in and where they went out, and take some minor credit, along with the student, of course, for something that happened between the pretest and the post-test, as opposed to they came from a good high school. Right, or they had a previous course. Um, unlike test scores, homework scores, things like that, because these tests are given unannounced, you're asking students really what they have in their head walking around on the street. Not what they can cram for an exam that they're not going to remember two weeks later, but things that they, they sort of know off the top of their head. Um, and um, in, in comparison to some things like tests or homeworks, um, Effort is not, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I try, to, I try to build some credit for working hard into my grading scheme to motivate students to work hard. 
So, so I tend to do some things which basically are just payoffs for working hard. Like labs, I don't grade them that hard because the students have to do a lot of work when they're in that lab. And I'm basically, I basically give them credit for working hard and trying to learn and asking me questions and all of that. The other advantage to this mechanism is that typically these assessments are quantitative and they're objective to grade. So like it would be great if we could assess how much our students know based on conversations we have with them in the hallway. That is really authentic measures of what a student knows. The problem is you can't quantify it or record it objectively in a way that allows you to compare this semester to last semester, to next semester, let alone to compare how your students did. You know, you think your students did crappy until you compare it to the national average and then you say, oh wow, they actually did okay, right? I thought it was bad, but it looks like in comparison to most places, that's pretty good, all right? So one of the advantages is that these are, these are nationally used exams. You can compare in the privacy of your own office how your students performed relative to other students. And you can keep records. How did the students perform this semester as compared to last semester as compared to next semester when you do something different? And so you really have a way to take a scientific approach to improving your instruction. You do an experiment, you measure the outcome. So, um, so let me give you some examples of the types of things that uh, this assessment data has done for the physics education research community in particular, but I think for the broader community of physics educators. Um, some of the things that became clear was that uh, we could do better. Um, another thing that Bob asked you yesterday was, he asked, you know, how do you decide how to teach? How do you decide how you're gonna teach your course? And things that often come up is, well, I teach the course the way I, that the course was taught to me. Or I teach the way my colleague taught the course. And although those are reasonable places to start, the data indicates that we can do better than that. And that's why your teacher is not here doing presentations. And my colleague is not here doing presentations, but rather people like Lillian McDermott and Ron Thornton and many other people who developed materials, tested them very carefully, modified them, tested them some more, modified them, tested them some more for years until they got materials that were really robust, techniques and materials that were robust, that could be used at all different kinds of institutions by people like me, the way I was 15 years ago, who didn't know anything more than I learned in a half day workshop. Um, so, so the evidence, um, let, me, let me show you some of the evidence. So one of the first papers that really sort of, one of the things that happened that really sort of shook the, the nation in regard to physics teaching was the force concept inventory, FCI, um, was developed in Arizona and they, they sort of mailed it around to people, I guess. I don't know, I was a baby at the time, but um, <laughs> My husband was not, and the story I hear is that they, they mailed it around to people. He even got a copy, although he's not in physics education research. And people would look at this test, and I'll show you the test, and they'd look at it and they would say, our students can answer those questions, no problem. And then they would give the test to their students and they would be mortified by, even after instruction, the, the very low rates of correct answers on, on questions that that people were sure students would know. For example, if you, you know, if you take a ball and you, if you take a, if you take a feather, if you take two balls, one of a heavy ball and one a light ball, but they're, they're, they're still both spheres and you drop them, which one hits the ground first, right? So, uh, or, you know, if you toss a ball in the air, what's its acceleration at the highest point? Do you know what its acceleration is at the highest point, you guys? It's zero. It is almost certainly zero. Um, <laughs> and, and, and things like that. And these, these ideas are ideas that are not crazy. I mean, that's what Aristotle thought, right? I mean, isn't that what Aristotle thought? That force, force was proportional to velocity, right? Um, and the velocity is zero there. So, so these are not crazy ideas. They're not just like tell them the truth and they'll understand it ideas. 
These are ideas that are a part of the way students view the world that can be very difficult to shift. So what this graph shows is um, pre-instruction percent correct on the force concept inventory, FCI, and gain, which is percent post-test minus percent pre-test. So, you know, if you, if you come in at 50% and then um, you go out at, um, for, at 65%, you're somewhere in here because the post-test minus pre-test would be 15 and the pre-test would be 50 or somewhere in here. The red symbols are all people who did not use research-based techniques. They did not try to engage students in their classroom. They used sort of a lecture to your students, do the labs that you had, you had done to you, um, you know, the same labs that have been, been being done for the last 50 years or whatever. Um, and we, we maybe disparagingly call those traditional courses. We got to come up with a better name, but that's what was on this slide, so that's what we'll leave. This is the way the data was published. In the green dots are what was being called at the time interactive engagement. And this came off of a paper which was called a 6,000 student study of learning outcomes in mechanics or something like that. 6,000 student study, if you Google that with the name Hake, who's the author, you'll, you'll get a hit right away. Um, so there were 6,000 students in this study at all different institutions. You can see high schools, colleges, universities, and there's a lot of scatter in the data as you would expect for human subjects data, um, but there are trends. Um, all of the greens are above all of the reds. Um, some people wonder what those lines are. Those lines are lines of equal normalized gain which is another, in, if, if you only know a few things about assessment and want to be able to talk to somebody in the physics education research community or somebody about assessment, this is one of the things you should be able to talk to them about. So one of the common things that we do um, in using assessment in, in physics is to normalize gains. In other words, we don't just look at what is their post-test score minus their pre-test score. Because what if they came in at 90? That gain can't be greater than 10. And that's different than if they come in at 10 and they could go up by 90. It's just different. So we normalize them. Um, we take post-test minus pre-test. That's their overall gain, how much they learned. And we divide by how much they didn't know when they came in. So if you come in at 80, if you come in at 80, can you really still see me? Can you, if you come in at 80 and you go out at 90, you went up by 10%. But coming in at 80, you only could have gone up by 20%. So you got 50% of what you didn't know, a normalized gain of 50%. Likewise, if you come in at 20 and you go out at 60, you went up by 40%. But if you come in at 20, you could have gone up by 80%. So 40 divided by 80, you went up by 50%. So you can, have, there's, you, can, you can have big debates about whether it's right to normalize the data or not because there's like a, a hole filling, a, a vacancy filling argument that it's harder for people to learn when they've only got 10% left to learn. But this is what we do in our community and that's what those lines are. They're lines of normalized gain. This is sort of another way to look at the data and this is different data um, but uh, equivalent data. If you take the fraction of courses that score in a given um, sort of bin of normalized gain, you again see that the traditional courses are at the low end. And the, the courses which use um, modified teaching techniques and research-based materials, there's, there's a big distribution, but they are in general better, and they go to some very high numbers. So, so this, is, this is a piece of evidence that came from assessment data, which I think is really important. Let me, let me show you quickly. Um, so these are questions on the force concept inventory. Two metal balls, about the same, they're the same size, but one weighs twice as much as the other. The balls are dropped from the roof of the single story house. I sort of alluded to this question. All right, so that's one of the force concept inventory questions. Um, Two, the two metal balls from the previous problem roll off a horizontal table with the same speed. What about that? How long does it take them to hit the ground there? Um, there are uh, questions about, you know, if this, if this ball is rolling through this semicircle when it leaves, what's its trajectory look like? Um, and sort of a related question, 
um, about a string that breaks on a rock. So there's 30 questions. There are multiple choice questions of this nature. Um, instructors thought students should be able to answer these correctly. It turned out that in most environments, they, they really couldn't. Uh, um, but that there were things people could do to improve those learning outcomes. Um, another exam, which uh, is in the same domain, um, the domain of mechanics is the Force and Motion Conceptual Evaluation, FMCE. This, um, thanks, this assessment um, is, uh, it's different in that there are sort of clusters of questions about the same topic. So you get more detailed information about do your students really understand Newton's second law? So for example, these are some Newton's second law questions. They're all about this person pushing on a sled. And the questions ask, um, what, what's the nature, the general nature of the force under different situations? And it says the guy's got spiked shoes on, but there's no friction. And so the only force on the sled is from the guy pushing on it. And so what force would keep the sled moving to the right and speeding up at a steady rate? So constant acceleration, it even tells you, constant acceleration to the right. Doesn't matter, it's constant acceleration. That must be a force which is increasing and to the right. Why? Because the velocity is increasing and to the right. I don't mean to confuse you. I'm trusting you know your physics. It's actually, <laughs> the correct answer is F equals MA. So if the acceleration is constant, the force must be constant. And if the acceleration is to the right, which it is because this is moving to the right and speeding up, the, the correct answer is the force is constant and to the right. The most common answer is whatever the velocity is doing, that's what they think the force is doing. That's what students think the force is doing. So there are questions like this, a whole cluster of questions like this. There are clusters of questions about forces for a car on an incline. I'm going to scan through here. There are um, graph. Another thing about this exam is it probes understanding in a couple of different sort of cognitive domains, so to speak. Fancy words, right? But um, natural language, so words, graphical uh, representations. Same concept, but represented in different ways. Um, there are um, more kinematically oriented questions, which relate um, velocity directly to acceleration rather than velocity to force. So this is the force in motion conceptual evaluation. The first exam I showed you was the force concept inventory. They measure in the same domain, but they're really sort of different exams. Um, so we've seen some force in motion conceptual evaluation questions. Um, I used the force in motion conceptual evaluation when I was at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So what happened was I went there. They were just starting this program called Studio Physics. And studio physics came out of an early program called workshop physics. And studio physics grew into what's called scale up. Has anybody ever heard of a studio or scale up classroom? Have one, seen one? Studio or scale up classrooms? Raise your hands high. So these are really the same things. Studio classrooms or scale up classrooms. Um, they're sort of defined by, I think most clearly defined by, the fact that they integrate lecture and um, laboratory in the same class periods and in the same classrooms. So you have to redesign your classrooms, not so unlike what we've got here, so that you've got big tables that students can work on as opposed to little desks or benches or something like that, so that students can get some information by lecture, but also that they have room to work. Um, so they're specially designed classrooms. Usually technology is present in the classroom to enhance the learning um, experience for the students. And the students are doing things during class time. Now, for many people, this sounds like that would be a positive, uh, positive environment, a positive change to the classroom and to the, how, learning is, how teaching and learning go on. The question is, does it, right? That's what assessment does for you. It takes something that sounds good, and it allows you to ask, does it work? Does it work in this situation? Um, and if it doesn't work, is there anything I can do to make it work? So long story short, what we did was um, we took the studio class at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in um, spring of 1998, and that is starting to date me. Um, and we divided, there's tons of students there because it's an engineering school.
school. So we divided students. Um, there were 10 sections of the, the course running at once with 50 students each, so about 500 students. And we, we broke those sections up into two broad categories. One which would have the studio experience, but at the time what they did in the studio experience was basically just the same labs they had done in the old course, but now they did them in the new classroom. Right? That's what you would do too. To start with, you, you make this major change. You're thinking what matters is now they're working in small groups and all of this. Take the, la take the labs that we have, because that's what we have, and let's use them. The other category of students, still in the studio environment, got research-based materials. Things from Ron Thornton, things from Melinda McDermott, research-based materials like you're learning about here. Everything else about it was the same. The students did this, they had the same classrooms, they did the same homework assignments, they followed the same schedule, they had the same lectures, PowerPoint presentations I put together, took the same exams. They had different teachers, but when possible, I sort of divided up sections. Um, so really, the only difference between the two groups was whether they did research-based materials in their time in class, or whether they did the old materials that had been in use in the old environment. And what we saw was that um, both on the, because I was a wicked skeptic at the time, I thought that maybe if you use materials developed by Ron Thornton and you measure using his exam, isn't there something kind of weird about that? Like the person who's developing the materials get to, gets to write the assessment? I thought that was weird. Um, and so I did both the force concept inventory written by somebody else and the force of motion conceptual evaluation, both of those exams um, at the same time. So students got both of those. Um, and what I saw was that as compared to traditional instruction, the students in the studio classroom, in the stripy bar, did really no better than students in traditional classrooms. On the other hand, when we added the research-based materials, and again, this is the same semester. They took the same final exam. They took the same semester exams. They did the same homework. The only thing that was different was the materials. There was a big difference on either exam that you used to measure it, a big difference in how those students performed in terms of their learning outcomes, their conceptual learning outcomes. So there's a couple important messages I want you to get from that slide. One is that just because it seems like a good idea doesn't mean it's working. And that's shifting the emphasis from teaching to learning. What is actually happening? Not what sounds like a good idea, but what is actually happening. And this is why I don't worry very much about MOOCs, because until they can show me that there's any real learning outcome for typical students, I think they can do whatever they want, and it'll be a little uncomfortable. But in the end, if they don't work, they won't stay. So during the course of your lectures, all the same materials subjects were presented equally, but just in two different ways, with the Studio Plus and with the standard Studio That's Plus. correct. So everything was, sub all the subjects were exactly the same. Yes. Students every week, this was a very uniform course because these students were engineering students and the engineering schools wanted to make sure that when students came out of this course that they all had the same experience. That they all, so they all did the same homework, they had the same textbook, everything was the same except for when the students were in class doing something, some were doing things that looked a lot more like the labs I took, and others looked a lot more like things that you're gonna see this evening with Lillian McDermott, or, tomor or tomorrow with Ron Thornton, David Sokoloff. Yeah? Is it possible to put meaningful error for us? Yes, and I, and I did, uh, uh, I did, but I'm not going to hear, so <laughs> sorry. But yes, you can put error bars on them, absolutely. I mean, so it's pretty good statistics, and you can, you can, standard, you can do a, a standard deviation and then you know, a standard error. You said that you implemented both of these in the classroom. How much time? So, so I'm going to come back to that. But let me just say quickly that you can do assessment reasonably efficiently if you do the following. Give the pretest. Either the first week of class, how many people don't hold labs the very first week of class? Well, hold labs and have them take the assessment. All right, that's what we do. 
We don't say, oh, no lab the first week of class. We say, there's lab the first week of class, and the students come and take the assessment. So there's no lost instructional time because we didn't use that instructional time to begin with. Or um, you can do you know, a day, like maybe not the first day because you want to talk about the syllabus or something, but maybe the second day while people are still getting settled, they're still getting their textbooks. You know, It's not a hugely efficient day to begin with. Or maybe you need to go to a conference and you're going to have some graduate students sit in there or a colleague or something. You know, any time during the first sort of, you know, couple of weeks that works. And the same with the post-test. It doesn't have to be right at the end of the semester. It can be as, as long as you've completed the, the material. If there's a date that really works for you, because, for example, you're going to be out of town and you could have somebody proctor this assessment for you. So think strategically so that you don't have to lose instruction time to do this. I gave them the two exams together. And my recollection, it's from 98, but my recollection was that they had an hour and 15 minutes to do them both and that most students finished in well under an hour. So one thing I want to I, I mention is that a, another way you can look at the data is you can plot pre-test score versus post-test score and each dot um, represents one or more students. This is a bubble plot, so the size of the, the dot represents the number of students who have that pair of pretest, post test scores. So the smallest dot is one student, and the biggest dots are, I forget, it's three or four or something like that. It's not a huge number. Um, and this is in the standard studio. So we, we had made this great renovation to space, this really interesting idea of integrating lecture and lab. Students were doing things in class. It looked really good when you came in and looked at it. But what you see is not a whole lot of motion off of the zero normalized gain line. Come in at 20, go out at 20. That's zero normalized gain. Come in at 100, go out at 100. <laughs> There's a few of those. right? So this is zero gain. Some people go down. This is a real data point, I swear. Not <laughs> <laughs> You see a lot of clustering in, in, in not that much improvement ranges, and not a lot up in that um, upper left-hand area where you would see real, really strong improvement if students had gone up a lot. They would come in with low pretest scores, go out with high pretest scores. This is the data for the classes that use the modified materials. Again, studio physics, st studio environment, or scale-up environment, however you want to look at it. But you see a real shift off of the zero gain line. Many fewer people in this small negative gain. We didn't confuse as many students. That guy's gone. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just leave that data point there because it's funny to talk about. And you see a lot more people in that upper range. Um, when I showed this data to my department chair at RPI, he said, what's going on is that you are helping the weaker students, but I think the stronger students suffer from those materials. The stronger students would be, are better off with the old materials. And I thought, oh, I hope not. So what I did was I broke the data up by pretest scores. Bottom third of pretest scores, middle third pretest scores, top third of pretest scores, and then I looked at the gains within those sections. And it turned out that whether you look at the traditional materials people were using, or whether you looked at the research-based materials. There, there was not a preference for the bottom students. Everybody everybody's sort of learns. It's just that with better materials, I call them better materials, with research-based materials, you get more learning for everyone, the top students and the lower students. OK, so yeah, questions? Right. So, so there's a couple things I want to say say about that. Um, first of all, I don't think that teaching to the test is a dirty phrase as long as you are not drilling for a test. I think my view of the world is. You start a course knowing what you want your students to learn and be able to do at the end. Know what you want them to learn and be able to do. Then you think about, how can I help them learn that material? And you focus hard on what can I do to help them learn that material. And then you measure whether or not they have learned that material. And that is teaching 
to a test. It's not drilling to a test. It's not repeatedly giving them the same or similar questions, but it is teaching to the test. And so I would argue we should be teaching to the test. We should know what the end is we want, and then we should design courses and teach courses which help us get there. So what I would argue is that if what they mean by teaching to the test is drilling on the same or similar questions, then I think they should be able to provide some evidence for that. Because the truth of the matter is you're so busy trying to get through all of that material, you don't have any time to be drilling students on questions. You're just doing, every, you know, you're just doing everything you can do to get through the material before the end of the semester. I don't know anybody who drills students on these these questions. And so, you know, you can, you, that, so, uh, but also I got to tell you that you cannot change people's minds. I mean, p people have opinions that, uh, you know, I've seen people engage in conversations that I was like, wow, are, are they on drugs or what? Because they're scientists, yet, you know, they're seeing, they're looking at this evidence that their colleague took and they're saying, well, I don't believe it. And I said to them, what, you, you think that, that what, he, that he, he fudged the data? No, no, I don't think that. He wouldn't do that. I said, so you think that the test is not a reliable measure of what the students know? No, no, they should be able to do that. And, you know, I'm just confused about why it's, they, they don't, they don't accept it. But I'll tell you that people, some people you just got to agree to disagree. But I don't think you should feel bad about teaching to a test if you're not drilling. Um, so these are, this is about the FCI and FMCI. Y yes. And those are, as a pretest, they work because people have, you know, uh, yes. about yes. how pores work, yes. et cetera. But there are some courses, like upper division courses, like quantum mechanics, yes. where people don't actually have any uh, intuition about it already. Yeah. Uh, how do you design an assessment for that, and is it worth doing a pretest? Well, so so uh, this is a good question. I mean, for example, I'm teaching this course for liberal arts students now, and I find that it doesn't do any good to pretest them because they don't know anything. Uh, I mean, they just don't, there, there's nothing, there's nothing really there to look at. Um, and so, and, 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 and it's worse than that. I'm teaching them some electricity stuff, circuit stuff, and they don't know the terminology. They don't know what current is. They don't know what voltage is. They don't know, you know, so it really doesn't do any good to pretest them. So I guess what I would say is that, you know, if you have an assessment you're going to use, you can, you can pretest your group once or twice. And if you become convinced that you're really not getting any meaningful data, that you can pretty much say whatever their post test score is, is learning, then I think you don't really need to do a pretest. But for many topics, students do come in with knowledge that they've gained either informally or in previous instruction. And it's important to know what that knowledge is so you can modify where you start the course and what you emphasize, as well as interpret your post-test scores. Yeah. Yes. This question test is uh, how the student understand why we have to put it as an assessment test. Why we don't contrast, con construct our exam to have this kind of question? If the student don't know how to answer the question, they fail the class. Because this is well, so are you saying that students who fail the assessment should fail the class? I, no, I'm saying at least my exam should have part of the exam really exam how the student understand. Yes. Yeah, it has some of the question like this. If the student understand this material, they shouldn't pass the class. They should fail the class. Yes. Yeah, so, so a couple of a couple of points. Let me say. I think one of the things that make the research-based materials that you're learning about here work is they force students to think. They, they put students in situations where it's really hard for them not to be thinking. And in fact, there's even cute video that this guy, Joe Reddish at the University of Maryland used to show about this student, there's this cluster of students, they're working on a lab, and one of the students says to the other student, oh, I hate this stuff, he's always trying to make us think. And the other student says, well, I don't really mind if he makes us think as long as I get my A. Um, <laughs> And I do think that, I think that that's one of the values of carefully designed materials. I think that underneath, that's part of what makes them work. 
And I also agree that if this is important to you, then it ought to be on your test because what students get graded on sends them a message about what's important for them to understand. But it's important that the questions that you put on your test are not exactly these questions because otherwise you are teaching to the test. The students see the questions too many times if you put them on your, so, so if you say, I want students to be able to answer this question, I'm just gonna take this question off the assessment and put it on my exam. Well, if you do that and then it, you know, then, then they get that exam back because there's a grade on it. So they get, they have to be able to look at it. They can study it. Right? They can memorize it. Yes, so you have to think about new questions. That's, that's the point, right? So I, I absolutely agree that your exam should include questions of the same type that are on your assessment because your assessment should be totally linked to your course goals. So, um, so we're, at, we're out of time, so let me just get to that slide. <laughs> so this always happens to me. It always, always happens to me. So let me tell you one piece of advice I have for you guys. You're going to hear all kinds of stuff, right? And you're going to go home thinking, what the heck am I going to do? I have all this stuff. Pick one or two of the techniques that you hear about that you think match who you are, match who your students are, match who your, what your institution is like, Pick a couple, one or two of the techniques that work well for you, that seem like they're, they're, they make sense to you, and try those. Choose course goals, and then pick an assessment, one of these that already exists. I didn't give you, but I'm going to. Pick an assessment that aligns with those course goals. So pick techniques one or two, not too many, that align with who you are, who your students are, what your institution's like. Pick an assessment that aligns with your goals and the techniques that you're going to use. So if your technique is focused on developing conceptual understanding, then pick a conceptual test. Don't pick a test of lab skills if the thing you're trying to, if the technique you're trying to use is focused on conceptual understanding. You follow what I'm saying? Align the, align the technique with the course and you. Align the assessment instrument with the technique. What are you trying to accomplish? Give the pre-instruction assessment some time when you're not going to waste time. I think you can find it. Maybe you can't. I don't want to have a big debate about it. If you really, really can't, then I think, then I think it's not as much of a driver for you as it is for me. I always find time because it's important to me to get this data. I want this data. I find time where I don't feel like I'm ripping off the students and I use it to take assessment data. Give the assessment unannounced, ungraded, and please do not return these assessments. Do not let people walk out of the room with these assessments because otherwise they're not as, they, they, they lose validity. Then do your best in your course with this one or two new techniques that you learned about. Do your best. Give the post-test. Again, make use of some wasted day. You have to go to a conference, or usually we give them the last week off. Or you can give the assessment as prep for the final. You can say, we're going to have, and we're going to do a, a test. Um, you can hand it in, and then any questions you have on it, we'll talk about. And this is material which is important for the final. That encourages students to do their best, and, it, and it's good use of the time. It helps students think about what they know and what they don't know over the final. And then look at your pre-test, look at your post-test. You don't have to tell anyone else. It's not about what somebody else thinks of your data. It's about what you think of your data. You are informing you. Learn from that comparison between what they knew starting and what they knew ending, and then repeat over and over again. If it didn't work, see if you can figure out why the technique didn't work for you. Was there something that you didn't do that the, the developers said you needed to do? Um, did you not do it enough? Like, I'm going to do peer instruction, but you only do it twice all semester. Do you really think it's going to make a big difference? Probably not. But you can repeat the experiment. And then collect the assessment data again, and you will, you will have data that can inform your instruction. And that
that's the reason to do assessment. Not to verify that these techniques work or don't. People have done a lot of that already, and they do work for a wide variety of people. If they don't work for you, we could ask why. All, everything that I've said is also really helpful to administrators who need data, assessment data, especially data linked to student learning outcomes. They, they want that, they need that, because we live in a world of accountability now in education, and people want to see that students have learned something. So I think it does help make administrators thankful. It's also really interesting applied science, so be careful, because it, it's a little like drugs. You might be, you know, you, you might find you like it, uh, and then you'll be doing assessment for the rest of your life. But mostly because I think that you're here because you want to be good teachers. And if you want to be a good teacher, Assessment can really, really help you figure out whether your students are learning anything in your courses, anything that you, that you care about. So that, that's it. I don't know how many slides I skipped, like probably half of them, but still, there you go.